and verses 6 through 8, so you may wish to... So this is when the um, blowing of the seventh trumpet occurs, it's that the mystery of God might be finished, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We're talking about, it's talking about the same thing. Because when Christ is in us, the hope of glory, his commandments become an actual fact in our lives. So. But here in Re Revelation chapter 19, and verse 6, let's look at that together. It says, let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. Yes, it's true that there is something that the Lord Jesus cannot do for her, that she must do for herself. And that is that she must uh, put on her garment. By the way, the garments had been purchased for her, which is the dikau sine of Christ. But when she puts them on, it becomes dikau mata. <laughs> All right, so in verse 8 it says, And to her was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. And that word righteous is dikau mata, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's that, it's that keeping of the commandments of God in actuality and reality. So here again, this verse 8 is the third angel's message in verity. Now, what's significant when we mentioned this earlier is that the evangelical message is that righteousness is only a declarative act of God. That God can declare you to be forgiven and righteous, <laughs> but it's a fiction because you aren't really. <laughs> but the unique Adventist understanding of the cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary is that when God declares a person righteous, they are in fact righteous. That That is in, imparted to them and becomes a living realm. That's the practical dimension of the cleansing of the sanctuary truth. And we call it, we refer to it often as... Um, as the third angel's message in verity. So the transition from the righteousness of Christ, de Kaiosune, to the righteousness of saints, de Kaiomata, that's the theme of the 1888 message of Christ's righteousness, all during those years when Ellen White was so happy to hear. She said she had never before heard it proclaimed publicly. This was what the seventh angel blows his trumpet to say. Coming there to, again, I'll read it in Revelation 10, verse 7. In the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished. In other words, the gospel work will be finished. The reality of the writing of God's laws upon our hearts and upon our minds will be a fact not just a legal thing. Okay. And that's what Revelation 10 and 7 is talking about. So, when Ellen White heard these themes uh, from, well, here, let me give you her words here in the 1888 materials of Ellen White, page 349. She says, when Brother Wagner brought out these ideas in Minneapolis, it was the first clear teaching of this subject from any human lips that I had heard, accepting the conversations between myself and my husband. And her husband, James Springer White, had died many years before. And when another presented it, she said, every fiber of my heart said, Amen. I can just imagine her sitting on the front row listening to the preaching, and it, it thrilled her soul, you know. So, in spite of the opposition, and the rejection and even the hatred that the two with heavenly credentials kept, they kept doing their best to present the message. Now, you have to understand, this is why the message is not life. This is, this is why it's not life, because there's a resistance to the idea 
that character perfection can become a practical reality. And it's much easier to say, God just declares us righteous. Much easier to go along with the evangelical churches and their understanding of righteousness by faith. So we have that. This is the rock bottom problem here <laughs> with the 1888 message that people have with it. Uh, so let me just read to you from Wagner's, or from Jones's, The Cri Consecrated Way to Christian Perfection, how he expresses it here. And he, he's talking about Christ coming in our flesh. He says, In his coming in the flesh, having been made in all points like unto us, and having been tempted in all points like as we are, Christ has identified himself with every human soul just where that soul is. And from the place where every human soul is, he has consecrated for that soul a new and living way through all of the trials and experiences of a whole lifetime. And even through death and the tomb, the holiest of all at the right hand of God forevermore. And this way he has consecrated for us. He having become one of us has made this way our way. It belongs to us. He has endowed every soul with divine right to walk in this consecrated way. And by his having done it himself in the flesh, in our flesh, he's made it possible. He's, he's given actual assurance that every human soul can walk in that way. In all that that way is, and by it enter fully and freely into the holiest of all, and live a life holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and as a consequence be made with him higher than the heavens. Now, you think about that. <laughs> Myself, as I am now, if I had to walk past the holy angels, I'd cringe. <laughs> but in that day, when the Lord pronounces that declaration, here are they which keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, you can walk upright past all of the holy angels right into the most holy place and have a perfect right to be there. His Christ's righteousness has been imparted to your soul. That's good. I would say that's good news. That is very good news, and we, we want to cherish it, don't we? We want to receive it with all that faith can embrace. Note that the constant message is something never seen in any of the righteousness by faith gospel messages of the Sunday-keeping evangelical churches. Let us say they are sincere and faithful to the light as they have been permitted to see it, but they don't comprehend it. It's totally unique to the Seventh-day Adventist message that was sent to us in the 1888 era. And this special ministry of Christ as high priest centered in the most holy apartment of the heavenly sanctuary where the door was opened for the voice of the seventh angel a message never before clearly heard in world history. It is the message of the final cosmic day of atonement, the cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary that began in 1844. And yes, that most precious message was not, was not ashamed to speak this word. Uh, this is a quote from the same book, Consecrated Way, page um, I believe it's page 87 and 88. Jones says, perfection, perfection of character is the Christian goal. Perfection attained in human flesh in this world. Christ attained it in human flesh in this world and thus made and consecrated a way by which in him every believer can attain it. He, having attained it, has become our great high priest by his priestly ministry in the true sanctuary to enable us to attain it. So Jones uh, was not ashamed to declare Christian character perfection. Another way of saying it is sinless living in sinful flesh. That's a glorious practical possibility. It will be a reality. And that's what made Ellen White so happy when she heard this uh, because it was like cutting the Gordian knot in Adventism. Here's what Ellen White says in Testimonies to Ministers, page 91. 
This message was to be, bring more prominently before the world the uplifted Savior. That's the cross. The sacrifice for the sins of those who believe God's offer. No, that's not what it says. <laughs> she has this unique idea. Listen. The, the message, she's talking about the 188 message, was to bring more prominently before the world the uplifted Savior. The cross ought to be the center of every message that we proclaim to the world. The sacrifice for the sins of the whole world, because Christ tasted death for every man. So if he tested, tasted the ultimate second death, the curse, the curse of death for every man, that means that no man is destined for that curse. They've all been given the gift of eternal life, which he obtained. And then she proceeds, so here she has perceived in this Testimonies to Ministers, page 91 statement, this universal judicial justification for the sins of the whole world, that concept. Because the sins of the whole world were, God made him to be sin for us. He knew no sin. It was all imputed to him. And the, the glorious achievement for all men made it possible for God to treat every human being as though his or her debt of sin was paid. It became possible now legally for God to send his reign on the just and on the unjust. The chap, as Isaiah puts it in chapter 53, verses 5 and 6, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, for the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Isaiah 53, verse 6. So, in this statement, in Testimonies to Ministers, page 91, she says, the uplifted Savior, the sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Now, that's love. That's the love of the cross. See, this is the love of pardon to every sinner on earth. That's the motivator for them to experience justification by faith. The dikaiomata. And that's what she goes on to say. That the message of Jones and Wagner presented justification through faith in the surety. That's a reference to Christ. It invited the people to receive the righteousness of Christ. That's the dikaiosune, which is made manifest in obedience to all the commandments of God. The dikaiomata. She says she's in perfect agreement and harmony with Paul in Romans chapter 8, verses 3 and 4, with John in Revelation chapter 19, uh, and Revelation chapter 3. Just we've gone through those passages. Do so you see the shift in her statement? I'll read it again. It presented justification through faith and the surety. It invited the people to receive the righteousness of Christ, that's the dikaiosune, which is made manifest in obedience to the commandments of God. That's a dikaiomata. So the righteousness of God becomes our actual reality in obedience to the commandments of God. It is the third angel's message, she says, which is to be proclaimed with a loud voice and attended with the outpouring of his spirit in large measure. And that would be the latter rain. So that tells us that the latter rain is this message that we're talking about here, this shift from Dikkao Sine to Dikkao Mata. That is what the Holy Spirit will bless, enlightening the earth with its glory. Well, then there were those who inquired, questioned Sister White, and they said, if the message of justification by faith is the third angel's message, I've been asked this, she says, and I have answered this. It is the third angel's message in verity. She says, the prophet declares, and after these